when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar of the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. When he opened the sixth seal, and when he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? This is the word of the Lord. This morning, um, as we were getting ready for Father's Day, I'm like, you know what? What do we want to preach on Father's Day? How do we want to encourage dads? Let's talk about the tribulation. That's exciting stuff, right? Let, let's pull up a text as Caden's reading it that everybody's going to have no clue what that means. That's terrifying. It's horrifying. What do we do with that? I'm like, that's perfect for Father's Day. So let's, let's open it up on, on Father's Day. We're going to walk through this text. If you're new with us or, or semi-new, let me kind of bring you up to speed what's going on. For the year 2023, we as a church have decided to go through the final book of the Bible to unpack the entirety of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is one of the most misunderstood books in the entire Bible. Many think it's freaky and scary and terrifying, and, and I don't want to pull back and say that there aren't scary parts. Matter of fact, what Caden just read is some of the most terrifying parts of the entire scripture. So there are those parts. But at the end of the day, the book of Revelation is encouraging for us because it shows us that things aren't as they seem. That we can look out at our culture and we can look at how culture is going, how the world's going. We can see wars and we can see strife and we can see evil, all of this different stuff. And, and we can be convinced that God has left the throne. God has abdicated his throne. Jesus and Satan have played king of the hill and Satan has won. But that's not the case. What the book of Revelation does is it exposes the truth. It allows us to see things that are really true, regardless of what we see with our physical eyes. So when we pull back that curtain, we see that Jesus is on his throne. We see that God still rules and he still reigns, and that even the evil that is on this earth right now plays a part in God's ultimate redemptive plan. So there is good news in all of this, okay? Now, truth be told, what we're unpacking in this series called Sevens is by far far the stuff that gets the most credit when we're talking about the book of Revelation. This is where the movies are made. This is where the novels, the Christian novels are written, all about the stuff from chapter 6 through 16. We tend to skip chapters 1 through 5 and 17 through 22, all the good stuff, and we just focus in on the zombies and apocalypse stuff. We're like, we, let's just focus in on the weird. Let's write novels and make weird Kirk Cameron movies about it, and, and let's just go with that. So what we're trying to do in this series is unpack what's going on in the these weird times between chapter 6 and chapter 16, these times known as the tribulation. What do we do with that? So just to bring everybody up to speed, make sure we're on the same page. We cannot interpret chapters 6 through 16 with first, without first remembering what chapters 1 through 5 were all about. Remember, without chapters 1 through 5, if we just jumped into chapter 6, all of a sudden we're screwed up. Like if you just open the book of Revelation and you start with chapter 6, you're like, what in the actual heck is going on? But chapters one through five set the stage where God is on his throne. God has got everything under control. He invites John, the apostle John, up into the throne room of heaven to get this revelation. And don't ever forget when we're reading the book of Revelation that it's written as apocalyptic literature. It's not written as an American textbook in the 21st century. That's not at all how it's written. So there's imagery, there's numerology, there's all these wild beasts and characters that we're not used to, but the first century reader would absolutely be accustomed to this kind of writing. If you read the Old Testament, when you run across Daniel or Ezekiel, they're writing in apocalyptic prophetic tone as well. So this is what's going on in the book of Revelation. That's why it's a little bit odd and weird to us in our 21st century Western mindset. We just don't, we don't grasp that concept. So this is what's going on in the book of Revelation, chapters 1 through 5, God is on his throne. And then in chapter 5, remember this, this is really important. Chapter 5, John is invited into the throne room, and he sees in the throne room all of this incredible stuff, but the main thing he sees is God is on his throne, and God is holding something. 
in God's right hand, indicating his powerful, strong, majestic right hand. He's holding a scroll. And John sees that on this scroll, there's so many words that the words are bleeding off the page. Inside, outside, there's words everywhere. And John understands that this scroll needs to be unrolled because this scroll is the will of God for all of humanity. Past, present, future events of mankind, this scroll needs to be opened. Ultimately, John knows in the back of his mind, and we unpacked this last week, that in order for Jesus to come back, what we find in, in Revelation chapter 19, where Jesus returns and brings his church to himself, and all things are made new. No more tears, no more death, no more suffering, no more pain, no more anxiety, no more restlessness, which, by the way, that's what I'm requesting for Father's Day. That sounds pretty awesome, right? No more death, no more sorrow, no more sadness, nothing, no bad, no evil whatsoever. That day is coming, but John understands that can't happen unless this scroll is let loose. And unfortunately, this scroll is sealed with seven locks or seven seals. And John's like, hey, who's going to open this scroll? Or actually, an angel says, who's going to open this scroll? Nobody steps up. Nobody's able to, to unlock the scroll. John is crying. This is all happening in chapter 5. John is having an emotional breakdown. He's an emotional being. And he's just like, ah, we need somebody to open this scroll. And all of a sudden, Jesus, as the Lamb of God, steps forward. And he's the one that's worthy to open the seals on the scroll. So like I said last week, hey, John be careful what you ask for, right? Have you ever prayed a prayer and later on in life when it came true, you're like, maybe I should have prayed that differently. I should have been a little bit more specific in my prayer because God answered it exactly how I asked and man, I'm not sure I like the outcome. This is what's going on. John's asking, let this scroll be released. Let these seals be unsealed so that these things can play out so Jesus can return. Be careful what you wish for. Because as these seals are unsealed, some really bad stuff happens. Some really bad stuff plays out. Now, we're going to recap real quickly all the four seals. We did four of the seven seals last week that were unscrolled or unsealed, but today we're going to do the final three. But the point of all of it was, and this is where we kind of brought it all together last week, there's two encouragements when we walk through the tribulation. We've got to keep these in the front of our head. Number one, you've heard me say repetitively today, God is on his throne. Even though it looks like all hell is breaking loose and evil is conquering and evil is winning and Satan ha has triumphed, just remember that is not the case. God is on the throne. At the cross, Jesus defeated sin. Okay, so once and for all, the cross finished everything. So God is on his throne. Secondly, we, we need to remember the second encouragement, the second hope is that these events are ushering in Jesus's final return. Without these events taking place, we don't get to the good stuff. You need this stuff to take place for the good stuff to come. And we'll wrap up today and talk about that. But the first four seals, remember last week, we talked about the four horsemen, which for those of you guys that were WCW wrestling fans, the four horsemen was Arn Anderson, Ole Anderson, um, Terry, Tully Blanchard, and Ric Flair. Woo! Right? <laughs> Some of you guys remember Ric Flair. You don't know who the other three are, but Ric Flair is the boss of these guys. And so we presented that. But the four horsemen were long before these wrestling dudes, way before. So in the first century, when the book of Revelation is written, John sees this picture of the seals being unsealed. And as on, each of these seven seals is unsealed, a different tribulation, a different event plays out in human history. The first one was the rider of the first horse, the white horse. So a white horse comes out, and this is the horse of conquest. Again, stick with me. I know it's different. I know it's apocalyptic. I know it's weird. It's different than anything else that we typically preach. But it's this first horse, and the rider on it is riding a white horse. Many over the course of time, many of us that grew up in Christianity, we see a white horse and a rider, and we immediately assume, who is the rider? It's got to be Jesus. That's what they taught us in Sunday school. Every answer to every question is always Jesus. Like, who loves you? Jesus. Who created the earth? Jesus. Who cooked your lunch today? Je like, everything is Jesus. So when we say, who's the rider of the white horse? Jesus. Because of course it is. And if you go to Revelation chapter 19 and all the way through chapter 20, you see one riding on the back of a white horse, the conqueror of all conquerors, the king of kings, who is wearing many crowns, many royal diadems, which are king's crowns, and he's carrying a sword. The problem is, in Revelation chapter 6, this isn't Jesus. This is one imitating Jesus, one trying to be Jesus, trying to pretend that he is Jesus. This is one who's wearing a crown, but he's wearing a Stephanos, a wreath around his head, around his head, not a royal diadem. He's carrying a bow without arrows instead of a sword, 
and his entire job is to come in and allow evil to masquerade itself as good. So tell, ask yourself this. In our culture, re- regardless of your spiritual background, how often do we find evil masquerading as good? Culture trying to be convinced that what is evil is actually good, what is good is actually evil. So that's the white horse. That's the first horse. The second horse, which is very much part of our story, is the red horse, the, the horse of war. So the horse of war comes in, and his entire job is to pull, it says this in Revelation 6, it says his entire job is to pull peace from the earth, to create civil strife, not just nation against nation, but individual against individual. How many of you guys, your lives would be so much easier if there was not this tension between other individuals and yourself, right? This is the story of our culture. The third horse is the black horse. I always get the colors mixed up. It's the black horse. It's the horse of famine. So it's talking about a time when inflation is going to rise and people aren't going to be able to feed their families and feed their kids in certain parts of the world. We see this. We might not see this in America. We might be untouched by this, but trust me, there are kids, there are families. This is why we serve Altamont Elementary. There are still kids in our very community who go home hungry every single day. This is part of their story. It might not be happening to you directly, but it is happening to you indirectly. So these are the first three horses. The fourth horse is the horse of death, the pale horse. So he comes in and he opens up the grave and a quarter of the entire earth is wiped away by pestilence, war, savagery, all of this awesome stuff. And we went away singing worship songs last week, being very happy, right? What, what, what is this? The horse imitating himself as Jesus, the horse of war bringing strife between man, the horse of famine bringing hunger, and finally the horse of death and the grave. These are the first four seals. And we're going to John. John, why did you ask that these seals be unlocked? Because once the seventh seal has been unlocked, we can start looking for Jesus's return. Now, have these seven seals been unlocked? I think they have. So I think that's why Jesus's return is imminent. So what we want to do today is we want to look at these final three seals. We're going to spend the most time on seal number five. So if I'm going on and on about seal number five, don't worry, six and seven are really short. But number five is the coolest one of all seven, okay? So we're going to talk about this. Seal number five that we're going to open today, seal number five is the seal of martyrdom. We're going to talk about Christians who have been crucified, or not crucified, have been killed for their faith. So seal number five the seal of martyrdom. Caden talked about this, or Caden just read this for us a minute ago, but let me reread this portion. Verses nine through 11, check this out. One of the most interesting portions of the entirety of scripture, and it actually makes sense in the book of Revelation. This is one of those few passages that are like, oh, I kind of get this. Listen to this. When Jesus opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. So we're talking about martyrs and for the witness that they had borne. They cried out with a loud, loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. So there's this seal, unlocking of the fifth seal, and it's a sign that, hey, these things need to take place on earth. When these things take place, you can start looking for the return of Jesus. This fifth seal is the seal of martyrs. Did the first century Christian, did they understand this world? They did. Remember from the very beginning of this series, 40,000 Christians by this time had been martyred for their faith. So in the first century, 40,000 Christians under Emperor Nero, Emperor Domitian, these guys are killing people. They're lighting Christians up as candles. Haley, just, my daughter just got back from Rome. We've been to Rome. If you've ever been to Rome and you're around the Colosseum, stand out there and look over the city of Rome and imagine what it must have been like when Nero was using Christians as candles to light up the night sky so he could sit out on his balcony drinking a cocktail, enjoying the scenery of Rome as Christians were lit on fire. This is what's going on. These are the martyrs. Now, it says here, it says in this text that what's going on here is the cry of the martyrs. The martyrs are found under the altar. Interesting that they're under the altar, the blood of the altar. In the Old Testament, the altar is where the sacrifices for the redemption of sins was made and the blood would drip down. So the blood is coming and covering over the martyrs, but it's also this place that's showing that in some aspect, these martyrs have a priestly obligation. They're up to something. They have a purpose with what they're doing. And they cry out. It's interesting. This is what blows my mind. This, it actually makes me laugh because I can get where they're coming from. We see in the first four seals, the first four horsemen, there's a simple prayer by each of the four living creatures. With the white horse, the, the, the first living creature goes, here's my prayer, come. 
For the second horse, the second living creature cries the same prayer, come. Third living creature, come. Fourth living creature prays the prayer, come. And they're not praying that John would come up so he can get a better vantage point. They're praying that these riders would come, and they're ultimately praying that Jesus would come. So that's the prayer of the four living creatures for the four horsemen. But in seal number five, the prayer changes. Did you notice the prayer of the martyrs? It's really interesting because we've got to look and reflect when people have offended Jesus and have hurt Jesus, what's Jesus's prayer? Jesus's prayer is nice. Hey, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, right? You remember that prayer from the cross and all, everybody's turned away from him and Jesus is like, Father, forgive them. And we're like, no, blast them. Like these guys, these are the ones who sent you to, and then you realize, wait, I'm the one that sent them to the cross. You're like, no, 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 Father, forgive them for what they do. That's a good prayer. I like that prayer. What do the martyrs pray? 40,000 of them at least under the altar, covered in the blood, all of this stuff happening. Their prayer is this. Hey, Lord, how long until you avenge our death? Like, hey, hey Lord, when are you going to come back and get them? When's revenge take? Doesn't that seem a little bit odd for martyrs who gave their, faith, or gave their lives for the faith? That, you, you with me? That seems like a weird prayer. I ran across um, a quote this week by third century apologist Tertullian. I love Tertullian um, because if I was smart and I was a third century apologist, this might be something that I wrote, but he, he wrote something. I want to read it to you because it just blows my mind. He wrote something about what he wants to see happen to all of those people that are persecuting Christians. This is not biblical. This is not the way of Christ. This is the way of emotion. This is what happens when a person of God allows the flesh to speak, okay? So this is what Tertullian wrote about the people who had been persecuting Christians. This is, this is awesome stuff. He says this, at the greatest of all spectacles that last an eternal judgment, how shall I admire? How shall I laugh? I will rejoice, I will exult when I behold so many proud monarchs groaning in the lowest abyss of darkness, so many magistrates liquefying in fiercer flames than they ever kindled against us Christians. So many sages, philosophers, blushing in red-hot fires with their deluded pupils. So many tragedians, more tuneful in their expression of their own suffering. So many dancers tripping more nimbly from anguish than ever before from applause. What a spectacle. Like, he's, he's embracing this. What a spectacle when the world and its many products shall be consumed in one great flame. How vast a spectacle then burst upon my eye. What there excites my admiration, what my derision, what sight gives me joy. You would think it'd be like the sight of these people returning to Christ. That would give me joy. But no, he says, this is what gives me joy. As I see illustrious monarchs groaning in the lowest darkness, philosophers as fire consumes them, poets trembling before the judgment seat of Christ. I shall hear the tragedians louder voiced in their own calamity, view play actors in the dissolving flame, behold wrestlers, not in a gymnasium, but tossing in the fiery billows. What inquisitor or priest in his munificence will bestow on you the favor of seeing and exalting in such things as these? Yet even now, we in a measure have them by faith in the picturings of our imagination. That's sick. Right? You understand what's going on here? This dude has some blood. Like, he is like, let's get him. Is this what these martyrs are praying to Jesus? They're like, hey, Jesus, Nero lit us up. Then I had another thought, another thought. You know how in Revelation chapter 5, there are 24 elders, and we know that these 24 elders are 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament and 12 apostles of the New Testament coming to, together to show us that all of humanity, old and new, worshiping around the throne. And in the New Testament apostles, there's John. And John is the author being invited into this room. So John sees his future self around this altar, or, or around this throne. And now I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, there's also martyrs underneath this altar that are crying out this prayer, at least 40,000 of them. Do you know who 10 of these 40,000 might be? The original apostles. Take Judas and take John out of the equation, and 10 of them gave their lives for their faith. So I'm like, where are they? Are they under the altar, or are they around the throne as elders? I'm like, this is like some kind of trippy time-space continuum thing where John's seeing himself and his friends all over the place. So this is going on. What's their prayer? Hey, 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 God, how long until you avenge our blood? You know what happened to us was wrong. This ain't right. It's not good what happened to us. How long 
until you avenge our blood. How does Jesus respond? He gives them a coat. He comes over with a white coat of like consolation, being like, it's going to be okay. We know from what we've studied so far that suffering, whether it's these first four horsemen or even now all the way into, into martyrdom or what we're going to see with natural disasters and judgment, suffering is an indicator that Jesus is going to come back. So we're reminded in Scripture, this is what Jesus is trying to show these martyrs. you got to understand that your suffering is not in vain. There's a purpose to it. And this is collaborated for us. Listen to this. In Acts chapter 14, we see Luke, the author, kind of collaborating this for us. He says this. When they had preached the gospel, this first church, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. It's hard to be a Christian in that culture, much harder, I think, than it is for us today. So he's saying, hey, continue in the faith, and then listen to how it finishes. And saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. The key to the kingdom is not politics, it's not war, it's suffering. We read our New Testament differently when we put on these glasses, these spiritual glasses, and see that suffering is the key that unlocks the kingdom, and suffering is the way of the Christian. So many of us, especially people in my profession, when we preach the gospel, we always want to tell people, you start following Jesus, it's going to be easy, right? Sign on the bottom line, say this prayer, and from this point forward, it's going to be easy. That's not the case at all. You're being into a a life of sacrifice, of self-denial. Pick up your cross and follow me. You're literally saying, Jesus, even though I suffer, I know that my hope is in you. And my hope is much bigger than today. 1 Thessalonians 3, Paul says it like this. He says, therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we are willing to be left behind at Athens alone. So we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in the faith that no one be moved by affliction. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. What are we destined for? Number one, the kingdom of God, but also how we arrive at the kingdom of God is through suffering. That's some pretty scary news if we didn't have texts like Romans, where Romans chapter eight comes to us and says this, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and if children then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided, this is the sign that you are a child of God. You ready for it? It's like, oh, I get the Cadillac. I get everything Joel Osteen promises me. Like I get everything the, the, the prosperity gospel promises me. That's a sign that I'm following Jesus. Paul says, no, this is a sign that you're following Jesus, that you will suffer in, with him in order that you may be glorified with him. This is part of your calling. Verse 18 of Romans 8 says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is yet to be revealed in us. I I think we need to land there for a minute. I think we as Christians forget this. This is the Apostle Paul who has had suffering, unbelievable suffering, been rejected on every side of the religious branch. He's been beaten. He's been shipwrecked. He's soon to be martyred. All of this stuff, the emperor is going after him. He's like, ladies and gentlemen, listen, the, the suffering that we go through in this world is nothing compared to the glory of what's to come. But see, we've got to live it going fast forward. If we could live it in reverse where we knew, if we had lived what's coming, there is, we wouldn't complain about anything on this planet because the suffering that we have to endure as followers of Jesus pales in comparison to the life that we get in him. And then we see in Romans 8, 28, for all of us that are in Christ, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for those who are called according to his purposes. God has a plan for every single piece of our suffering. So whatever your story is, every single week we sit in the, in the conference room, the band, the media team, myself, just praying over the service, getting ready for the service, walking through it. Every single week, it, this is just a small handful of what we have as a church. People telling us, this is what I need you to pray for. We're praying for Dave Stockton's friend, Tim, who has esophagus cancer, stage four esophagus cancer. We're praying for all of these different things that are going on. And we're looking at it, and we gotta understand whatever our story is, Whatever your story is, whatever suffering that you're enduring right now, there's purpose in it. This isn't just God just disappearing. This isn't God abdicating the throne and saying, I have no control anymore. There's purpose in your suffering just as there was purpose for these martyrs. Now, here's where it gets wild. This is what blew my mind. There's an interesting verse in chapter six that we quickly glossed over. This is what it says in verse 11. 
each one of the martyrs, when they're, they're praying, how long, O Lord, before you avenge our blood? Jesus comes around and he, was, he gives them a white robe and told them to rest a little longer. What, what would you do if God came up to you in your suffering, you're like, I literally died for you. I died, and he'd be like, so did I. I did it first. Now it's your turn, right? So they're like, I died for you. When are you going to avenge our blood? And the king of kings shows up on the scene, and you're thinking, oh, here it goes. He, he's about to take out his wrath on all mankind, but he's got a coat in his hand, and it's a white coat of purity and holiness. He's like, here's a coat. Here's a blanket. It's gonna be a little while. Rest right? Isn't that what he's saying? Get comfortable. Rest where you're at. It's going to be a minute. So here's a coat. Well, how long is it going to be? Well, he also answers this question. He told them to rest a little longer until the number of the fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Time out. Do you get what that means? He's like, hey, I'm not going to return. I'm not going to avenge your blood until the number is complete. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a quota. Do you see it? There's a quota that needs to be filled in terms of martyrdom and suffering before Jesus can return. There's a number. We don't know what that number is, but until that number is full, Jesus doesn't return. So he's like, once that number is full, I will come back, which says something to us. Start thinking about what that means to you and your suffering today. Paul says this. This is where it gets really wild. In Corinthians, or Colossians chapter 1, listen to what Paul says, and it goes hand in hand with what Jesus is presenting to John. Colossians chapter 1, Paul says this. After he is just the one who just said, listen, our suffering pales in comparison to the glory of Christ. Colossians 1, he says this. Now I rejoice in my sufferings. You've heard this before, right? I've preached this before. If you've ever read Romans chapter five, I know Zach and Caden were going over this in their office the other day. Romans chapter five is the character formula. Hey, we rejoice in our sufferings because suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope, and hope does not disappoint. And now here in Colossians one, Paul's like, man, I rejoice in suffering. I'm like, you are sick. What kind of sadistic person rejoices in suffering? It's not like Paul is sitting there going, you know what I want today? A plate full of suffering. Bring on martyrdom, bring on cancer, bring on every pandemic, bring it all, pluck out my toenails, give give me paper cuts in between my toes, just bring it on. Is that what Paul's saying? And I will celebrate it. In lieu of what we know from Revelation 6, where Jesus' promise is, there's a quota of suffering. I can't return until this quota is full. And now Paul says, well then, you know what? I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of the body, his church. Do you see it? This is incredible. Paul just becomes a bigger spiritual giant. He's going, you know what? If there's a quota to be filled for Jesus to return, I'm going to do my part so that he will return quicker. I wanna take as much suffering on myself so somebody down the line doesn't have to take as much. I'm doing it on behalf of you. I'm doing it for your sake. My suffering, my martyrdom has purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not saying invite suffering in our lives. I'm not as strong as Paul but I want us to open our eyes to the fact that every ounce of suffering we have in our life has a purpose. It serves a purpose. It's pointing to the faithfulness of God to get us through it, but it's also ushering in the kingdom of heaven and saying, once this is full, once this is complete, so by suffering some weird way, I'm alleviating suffering from somebody. Does that make sense? This is what Paul and John are collaborating on in the act of suffering. Now, it's definitely talking about martyrdom as its key. So these martyrs are like, hey, when are you going to avenge our blood? And Jesus is like, wait a little bit longer. There's more to come. But ultimately, remember, none of your, or all of your suffering pales in comparison to what is to come in this. Peter O'Brien said, the more of these sufferings that Paul personally absorbed as he went about preaching the gospel, the less would remain for his fellow Christians to endure. That's why he could rejoice in suffering. It wasn't because he was sadistic. It was because he loved the people of Christ's church. The sixth seal. So we've got the four horsemen. We've got the fifth seal of martyrdom. The sixth seal, you got it in your notes, is earthquake. It's really earthquake slash heavenquake. Like the entire cosmos starts shaking. Check this out. Verse 12. 
When Jesus opened the sixth seal, I looked, I, John, looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone slave and free hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of God, or from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of wrath has come, and who can stand? Now, the, the end of this is what we're gonna talk about next week. Thank God, in God's providence, we go through six seals in chapter six. The seventh one is in chapter eight that we'll get to in a moment. But at the end of the sixth seal, all these kings and leaders and important people, then everybody else, the rest of us, normal people, we're all hiding in a cave because it's gotten so bad. And we're saying, hey, hey, who can stand against this? What are we supposed to do when this comes? And fortunately, Jesus takes kind of a little bit of a, a, a break. There, there's kind of a footnote, which is chapter seven, and says, this is who can stand. So next week is all the good news in the middle of all of this chaos. So this is what's going on. So seal number six, we're through the martyrs. We're, we've got all of this. The martyrs are praying, avenge, avenge your blood, avenge our blood, oh God. But really what they're praying is Jesus come back. Same prayer as the horseman, Jesus come back. Please, by coming back, everything will be right. And then the seventh seal is there's going to come a day when all earthquakes and cosmoses and all of this stuff, you're gonna see things in nature that you haven't seen happen before. All of this crazy stuff is going to happen. Now, real simply, this is a pretty simple seal. What's going to happen is God is finally going to allow man to get what man's always wanted. Since the garden, going all the way back to Genesis 2 and 3, all the way back to Adam and Eve, the request of mankind has been, I want to be in charge. I, I, I want to be God. I would like you to turn the throne over to me. In my prayer, how many of us in our prayer time, our prayers are simply trying to convince God to do things our way? Instead of, hey, God, I surrendered to your will. This is my will. Please make it happen. And so the sixth seal is God going, prayer answered. Here's your wish. You want to be in control? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my hand off the cosmos. I'm going to take my hand off creation. You see, I think we're so quick to point out to God or to look at God and go, God, if you are in control, why is all this stuff happening in this world? Why is all this evil happening if you are in charge? The better question should be, can you imagine what it would be like if he weren't? Imagine what this world would be like if grace was removed, if mercy was removed, if God's hand was removed, then wonder what the world would look like. But God's hand is on it, God's grace, God's mercy. By the way, the difference, just to clarify for you, the difference between grace and mercy, grace is us receiving what we don't deserve. So I don't deserve salvation. I don't deserve forgiveness. I don't deserve redemption. I, I, what does Romans 6 say? I deserve death. That's the wage that I have earned. That's what grace is. Grace gives you something that you don't deserve. Mercy says, I'm not going to give you what you do deserve. Mercy is saying, this is what you do deserve, but I'm going to keep it from you. God's mercy is what we see every single day of our lives. This is why the, the Bible says his mercies are new every morning because every single day, God's hand is on us and protecting us. We don't see what life would be like without his hand until the sixth seal and he pulls it back. And all of a sudden, the heavens shake and all of these terrible things happen. The seventh seal in culture, which we'll see in world history, is judgment. It's judgment. Revelation chapter eight. This is where we, we jump forward to chapter eight because chapter seven, we need a break. We're like, this is getting too heavy. Chapter seven comes in. We'll talk about chapter seven next week. And this is the final seal. When the lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in the heavens for about half an hour. So 30 minutes of silence. Then I saw the seven angels who stood before God and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. Are you catching any of this? This is weird stuff, right? Roman Catholics are like, you're starting to speak my language. I, I, I understand some of these words. And the angel, or in the smoke of the incense with the prayer of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, threw it on the earth, and there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. What the heck? 
here's the best I can do with, with this one. The seventh seal, it's the final seal. And the seventh seal opens up another section of sevens. So you get to the end of the seventh seal and you're like, ah, it's almost over. But unfortunately, the seventh seal opens up wrath. Seven different angels are given seven different trumpets of God's wrath and God's tribulation that's going to come out. That's our next part of this series is what's going on with these seven trumpets. Now, these seven angels are apparently seven archangels. In the Bible, these aren't listed. We don't know the names, but in ancient history, they were given names. Did you know the seven archangels have traditional names? I did not know that. We know Michael and Gabriel. Here are the other five in case you're looking for baby names or teenage mutant ninja turtle names. Here we go. Uriel, Raphael, there's Raphael, Raguel, Michael, Sarakel, Gabriel, and Ramil. These are apparently the seven archangels. And in the seventh seal, they're handed trumpets to blow out God's wrath. This is what happens all of a sudden. But what I want you to notice today is this golden censer. This is where those of you guys that were raised in the Roman Catholic Church, you like, we get it. We know what a censer is. Those of us that were raised in Protestant churches or no, no church at all, we're like, I have no idea what that is. Whatever. So it's this, it's this bowl. It's this bowl that contains incense and smoke, and the priest would shake. I've been to like one Catholic mass, so I'm sorry, former Catholics, if I'm butchering this, okay? But, but it's a bowl filled with incense. This is why just a minute ago, we sang a song, You Are Worthy of It All. We kept repeating it, repeating it, repeating it, but then the bridge, day and night, night and day, let incense, I don't want to, it goes way too high for me, let incense arise, and at this point, if you're paying attention to lyrics of songs, you should be going, what, what does that mean? Or are we just singing songs, day and night, night and day, let potpourri arise? Like, what, 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 what's going on with the incense? This is from Revelation chapter six. When this incense is filled and this incense is presented to God, what this is representative of is the prayers of all the saints. Every prayer you've ever prayed, every prayer you will ever pray is contained in that incense arising to God. So what's going on? They are above the altar. Below the altar is whom? Who's below the altar? The martyrs. And now these seven angels blowing these trumpets are on top of this altar, and they are praying prayers. They're, they're forwarding our prayers to heaven. So our prayers are being joined with the martyrs' prayers, and they're being sent towards heaven. And the prayer is simply, come. Jesus, please come. Can you imagine in heaven when this seventh seal begins happening? Because it says all of a sudden there's 30 minutes of silence. Like, that's not a big deal. No, it's, it's a big deal when you realize that for all eternity, there have been seraphim, or maybe not all eternity, but for a long, long time, there's been angels, and now there's 24 elders, and now there's millions of angels, and, and all of these creatures around God's throne, day and night, night and day, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Holy is the lamb who was slain. He deserves blessing and honor and glory and power and majesty and strength forever and ever. And this is continual. In the background, there's thunder and there's light. There's noise in the throne room. Then the seventh seal happens in silence. That would get your attention. If you've ever been to a Pentecostal church, it's that moment when it just goes silent. It don't happen often. All of a sudden, it's dead silence for 30 minutes. And at the end, we have these prayers going towards heaven. Jesus, come back. Jesus, come back. Have mercy on us. God, keep your hand on us. Jesus, come back. There is no doubt, as we read through Revelation chapter 6, through Revelation 16, it is meant to scare us. It's terrifying. We do not want these things right? Who wants evil masquerading as good? Who wants war? Who wants famine? Who wants death and Hades in the grave? Who wants to be martyred? Earthquakes, heaven quakes, judgment? Come, Jesus. And it's scary. Until we remember there's one on the throne. He remains on the throne. And secondly, all of this serves a purpose in ushering in his kingdom. Remember this. And this is so important. This week, many, I don't know if you did your homework. Last week, I gave you a homework assignment and asked you guys to read Matthew chapter 24, because Matthew chapter 24 does something powerful for Revelation chapter 6. 
In Matthew chapter 24, we're introduced to Jesus. Jesus is probably his most second famous sermon. His most famous sermon, I think it's hard to argue, is in Matthew chapter five with the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, I say to you, right? All of these things, that, you, the, the, that, that sermon just flips the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of darkness upside down. It's like, what do we do with that? The way of Jesus is different from the way of the world. But in Matthew 24, we're introduced to what's known as the Olivet Discourse. Jesus is on the Mount of Olives, and he prophesies something. Listen to these words. Tell me. The, so when we get to Revelation 6, and we're like, this is terrifying. Where did this come from? I didn't see this coming. This can't be under God's domain. God cannot be contro in control with all this stuff happening. Until we rewind to Matthew 24 and say, oh, wait, wait, wait. Jesus told us this was going to happen. And if Jesus said this was going to happen, it must be a good thing because it's going to usher in his ultimate kingdom. Check out, this is mind blowing when you really understand Revelation 6. Matthew 24, starting with verse three. As Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now we know Jesus, Jesus isn't telling us when he's coming. He doesn't even know when he's coming back. The Father alone knows. So he's not giving you, listen, June 20th, 2023, that's the date of my return, okay? So anybody that's out there selling books, saying this, you, you're funding demonic print because that's just not God. Our job isn't to figure out the date. That's why when we talk about pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, that stuff's important, but it's not a formula to figure out everything. That's not what's going on here. So these disciples come to him and say, hey, Jesus, what are the signs of the end of the age? And Jesus obliges. He answers them. Verse four, Jesus answered them. Tell me if this sounds familiar from what we know in Revelation six. Jesus answered them saying, see that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and they will lead many astray. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you seal number one, evil masquerading as good. Verse six, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed for this much must take place, but the end is not yet for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Seal number two, war, pulling out strife, civil, or pulling out peace, introducing civil strife. And there will be famine. Seal number three, and earthquakes in various places. Seal number six, earthquakes and heaven quakes. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Verse nine, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. Seal number four, which is death. And you will be hated by all nations and killed for my name's sake. Seal number five, martyrdom. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise. There's seal number one again and lead many people astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Verse 13, but the one who endures till the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Seal number seven, judgment. Jesus literally laid out for us all seven seals. This is coming. This is going to happen. But what did he call it? Did you catch it? What did Jesus call it? It's the beginning of birth pains the beginning of birth pains. Now, I have never given birth. I have been in the room for it. It's horrible. Like, like, like nine months, nine months, Caden, Caden turned 19 yesterday. So 19 years ago yesterday, we experienced this. 21 years ago, May 14th, we experienced this. Where we're young, we're naive, Melanie gets pregnant, and, and, and for nine months, I see her grow. It's beautiful, but I, I meant she glowed. That's what I meant as she grew. Her feet swell, swelled up, she was sweaty, she was miserable. By the end of nine months, what's the cry of most women by the end of nine months? By the way, those of you that are like pregnancy, I loved every second of it, good for you. You're, you're the unicorn, right? So at the end of nine months, just get this baby out of me. I'm so done, am I right? Yeah, yeah, and what are you, four months, five months? Six, okay, so she's like, make sure you get my number right. Give, give me my months. At the end of nine months, you're donezo. Like, get this baby out. It's been hard. There's suffering involved with it. Your body is shaped differently. All, you're ju it's just different. 
And then the day of the birth happens, but it's not just like at the end of nine months, oh, here's the baby. No, at the end of nine months, the worst day is there, right? It's like all seven seals just pop off just at once. You're like, here's 36 hours of labor. Yours is gonna be one hour, okay? Just 36 hours of labor. And during that labor, the, the, the woman is questioning everything. What have I done? Is this worth it? This isn't worth it. Why did you do this to me? Screaming at the doctor, screaming at the husband. Everybody's getting in trouble because the woman is so miserable in this moment, in this moment of intense labor. And then one o'clock happens on June 17th, 2004. Or 415 happens on May 14th, 2002. And all the suffering from nine months and all the suffering for those 24 hours, all of a sudden fades into the background because there's what? There's life. You're like, oh, it's worth it. And this is why Paul says everything pales in comparison to the life that is to come. So everything that we're going through right now, Jesus says it himself. He's like, this is just, this is just pregnancy. This is just labor. This is birth pain. Yeah, it's gonna hurt. Yeah, it's gonna be horrible and terrible, but, but hold on. Those who endure till the end will be saved because they will experience the birth the rebirth where all things are made new, all things are made right. Fortunately for us, we have a savior. We have a God who empathizes and understands our pain. He too was a man of sorrows. Hebrews four, and I'm ending with this. Hebrews four says this, since we have had a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, because of him, hold fast to your confession of faith. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize or empathize with us in our weakness and suffering but one who in every respect has been tempted, as we are, but without sin. If he had sinned, he doesn't qualify as our savior. Verse 16, let us then with confidence draw near the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. This is why we find out in the New Testament for the joy set before Jesus, he endured the cross. All the shame, all the pain, all the suffering that he endured on his way to the cross was worth it. He endured it because of the life that was gonna be bought with it. Every ounce of suffering that you're going through right now. In religion, some weird religions would come out here and say, listen, your suffering is just because God hates you. No, he doesn't. Are there consequences to our sin at times? Yeah. God's wrath on us, God's wrath on this world is an actually an act of love because he's a holy God. He's a just God. He will never tolerate sin. And we live in a broken world. But these events must take place so Jesus will return. And one day when he returns, we will be invited, his bride, those of us who have surrendered to Jesus and decided to follow Jesus. Now listen, this is where it gets tough. If you're not following Jesus, if you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus, this ain't for you. That wrath part, Everything we've just read, that's a picnic compared to what's in store for the one that doesn't follow Jesus. For the one who follows Jesus, life comes out of these birth pains. That's what he's invited us to. So the encouragement to you, Christian, today is in the suffering, endure till the end, hang on. Jesus hasn't abdicated his throne. He's not diminished. He hasn't gone anywhere. There's hope and there's purpose in your suffering. As a matter, matter of fact, maybe your suffering is alleviating suffering for somebody else. If you need that to help you, cool. Paul did. I rejoice in my suffering, knowing that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope. Hope never disappoints. Let's pray. Jesus, we know at the end of the day, our hope is in you and you alone. As a broken and fallen creation, we know that we have tried to put our hope in so many other things. Our skill set, our finances, our titles, our relationships, at the end of the day, those fail. Our hope is in what you have accomplished on the cross, that at the cross, you once and for all defeated sin. And because of that, you have purchased our salvation, that by coming to you as both our Savior and our Lord, by confessing our sins, by repenting of our sins, we can, by faith, make you king of our lives and Lord of our lives and all of our sin, past, present, future, is wiped away as far as the east is from the west. Our filthy, dirty rags are made new because of you. 
And now, Lord, as we live through this season of creation's history, this, this chapter, this brief chapter that we've been given in our few years here on this earth, I pray that every single moment, whether it's good times or bad times, we would look to the throne and be reminded of who you are and why you're there. That we would trust you when things get rough, that we would come to you in faith, believing that you do hear our prayers as you heard the prayers of the saints and the martyrs, and that our prayers do impact the heavens. So we present those to you. But may we present our prayers with humility, ultimately praying the same way Jesus did, not my will, but your will be done. Accomplish in and through me, in and through this church, what you wanna do for your eternal purposes, purposes that are so much bigger and wilder than anything we can imagine. Allow me this week to see my suffering through the lens of your hope, that these are birth pains, that life is coming. And once life is given, it will never, ever go back to what it was. So we commit our ways into you. God, I pray that if there's anybody here under the sound of my voice that doesn't yet follow you or know you, that today would be the day they would have the courage to say, Jesus, I, I trust you. I don't know everything. I don't have all the answers. Some of this is confusing if I'm honest. But I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you did die for my sins and I wanna follow you. Would you please forgive me? Would you please restore me? Would you please make me new? So Jesus, we give this into your hands. We thank you for being a faithful God, for not leaving us when we failed you. So today we celebrate this because you are worthy of it all. You do deserve all our praise. So we give it all to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and